We're back to the Toll Education Celebrity Show on the Toll Education Network, powered by the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment, TollTutor.net for more information. Twitter, Toll Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, also BeachLifestyle.com and SimplyG.com. And I'm really excited to welcome the program, United States two-time Olympian figure skater Michael Weiss. Michael, thanks for calling. Awesome. Thanks for having me. We're excited to talk to you, and I tell you, it's it's always, especially when you're doing such great things in the community, we're going to definitely talk about that and how you're raising uh, money and different things, but let's talk about your career first. Michael, was, did you always want to be a figure skater? Was that something that you always wanted to do when you were a kid? No, uh, not really. Actually, I started, I come from a pretty interesting background as far as my family goes. Um, my dad was a gymnast, actually. He was in the Olympics. Uh, back in 1964 in gymnastics. And uh, my mom was also a national champion in gymnastics. Uh, and then I have two older sisters. Uh, and they were in, one of them was a world junior champion in um, platform diving, you know, like Greg Luganis and the 10 meter platforms. And then uh, my other sister was a junior national champion in figure skating. So it was like, I was always in either gymnastics, diving, or figure skating growing up. And um, my middle sister, uh, basically, I went to the rink with her when I was about, about nine years old um, after being a diver before I was a diver early on. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the rink with my other sister and check that sport out. I went and I started picking stuff up uh, relatively quickly. And the coaches kind of gave me a lot of praise because I was picking stuff up fast. And, um, you know, as a nine year old, a 10 year old, you think that's kind of cool. So that's kind of how I got started in figure skating. And then the rest, uh, you know, as they say, is history. Well, most definitely, and I guess when you're growing up in such a competitive family, <laughs> all of them, are, hey. uh, you, you were bred, you were bred for this, Michael. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was. Uh, I guess my parents um, were both gymnasts themselves. Then they actually started a gymnastics school and taught uh, over in the uh, Silver Spring, Maryland area when I was younger. So I kind of grew up in the gym, you know, with other gymnasts all around me. So it was. It was some sort of flipping, twisting, or spinning sport that I was going to be involved in. It was just a matter of choosing which one. Well, absolutely, and, and I guess, and, and I'm sure that your family was able to give you a lot of advice and competition to know ultimately, and that might have definitely be, been a help. We look at research of like uh, of of celebrities' uh, children if they go into sports, how they most likely are going to have yeah. a good success because it, it's not always your athletic ability. It's 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 also the right. it's also your mental capacity. How do you handle yeah. adversity? How do you handle the competition? Do you get the right amount of rest? Look at the Mannings. I mean, yeah. who would have Archie Manning thought that he'd have two his sons would be better quarterbacks than he was? You know, and and, yeah. and went further and to that high level. So let's go uh, specifically, Michael, how you got involved in the figure skating game. So basically you were saying that you look like you were going to be a gymnast, but who uh, kind of yeah. got you involved in the, in the figure skating? Well, I, I first I started out as in diving. Um, like I said, I kind of grew up in the gym initially, but never really took to that. Uh, then I went to diving, actually, with my oldest sister, Um, And I was a regional champion when I was like seven, eight in that range years old. And then um, basically I just kind of, you know, I wasn't into it. I'm like, you know, this isn't my thing. I want to try something different. And my other sister had been a skater and started skating, and she was already kind of at the regional level. Um, And so my mom said, basically, let's go to the rink and try skating and see if you like it. Um, Tried on a pair of skates the first day, and uh, and I was actually pretty bad (laughs) initially. And my skating coach, who later on became my skating coach, Audrey Whisker, took me to um, two Olympic Games. But when she first saw me, she said, uh, you know, she said jokingly, she's like, all right, he's not going to be the skater in the family. Talking more about my sister, like my sister was the talented one. I wasn't going to be the skater in the family. Kind of broken fun with my ability the first time on the ice. But um, then I picked things up quickly. You know, within a week or so, I started to get comfortable on my feet within, within a year. I was, um, you know, competing on a regional level. And um, so, yeah, it was it was something that I didn't take to right away. But um, when I did start to get the hang of it, um, you know, following my sister's footsteps, she, she was, uh, like I said, a great skater. She was a junior national champion as well. So it was, I, was, I was always kind of Jeremy is her name. I was always kind of Jeremy's little brother 
um, until probably the age of, I'd say, maybe 14, 15, when I tried started to make a name for myself on the national level. Interesting. So they really didn't expect you to be as good as your sister. So you're you're sitting here, yeah. you're, you're, you're sitting here in the back seat, and, and it's amazing, Michael. I've been talking to a lot of Olympians. We're creating this segment. We're finding out most of them that have had success to become Olympians. No one gave them a chance because <laughs> again, yeah. it's, it's 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 something like, oh, you know, you're not to be, you're not going to be the one. No, someone else is going to yeah. be. So, yeah. and the amount of time you have to put into the gym, and now, I mean the ice rink now, but the, the amount of time you have yeah. to put in, does it help that, that your mom and dad did the same thing when they grew up, and they kind of gave you some advice of how to yeah. handle that and train right? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know it's. It's, it's it's hard for some parents, if you haven't been involved in a sport or athletics before, to to kind of be able to relate to, you know, getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning when you don't want to and, you know, skating before school and then, you know, having to miss some school activities in order to go to skating competitions nationally and, you know, what it's like to fall on, on an element, you know, 500 times before you ever successfully do it. I mean, it's, you know, you can kind of try and relate to it, but there's a different level of understanding if a parent has already done that. Um, you know, my parents had already gone through that, you know, making their own Olympic teams, and, and they know what it's like to come home sore and tired and, and you know, let down at a really disappointing competition. And, and they, they see those things, and they're able to, you know, help you, um, because of their experience, give you a little bit of insight on how to deal with that. And, and I also think it's, it's an expectation level, too. Like, um yeah, you know, I have kids now who are uh, 14 and 15, and, and I believe, uh, my wife and I believe that it's, you know, it's an expectation that you set for your kids. You know, if you're expected to get good grades and be successful in athletics, you set that standard for them, and they, they naturally go after it and achieve it. And they may fall short here and there, and then they may overachieve sometimes. But, um, but you know, there's a standard that you set being a parent that's done it before. And, um, and and that's important, and you have to be there for your kids. And, and um, you know, myself going through it again with my kids, um, you know, I can, can relate more to uh, what it's like to come home sore and tired and, and not want to go out there and do that extra workout. But that's what you got to do if you want to be, um, you know, if you want to be the best at what you do. All right, we're talking to Michael Weiss, two-time Olympian, and we're learning that, again, people weren't giving him a shot. His family were probably like, okay, Michael, I guess you're not going to be one of our uh, uh, world-class athletes. <laughs> and then, I guess, did you were you a late bloomer when finally 14 and 15 you started winning competitions and people said, hey, you might be something now? Um, yeah, I think it, it was more like right when I first started getting on the ice is when people were kind of, Thinking, all right, he doesn't have the natural skating ability that that uh, that say my sister had. Um, but then, but then within, I say within a year, I started to get the hang of it. But literally, till I was fourteen, fifteen is until I really started to realize that this was something that you know maybe I could make a career at and be be one of the best skaters in the world. Um, and I think that's uh, when I. When, I, when my first international competition really was when I was able to gauge myself. And I knew that I was kind of good at a regional level and even maybe, in, you know, on the East Coast. And But I was like, okay, what does that really mean as far as the Olympics go? You know, so I'm good on the East Coast of the United States. There's the whole rest of the world i got to compete against. So I went uh, to my first international competition in Seoul, Korea uh, when I was 16. And uh, I played second against... Um, you know, the best skaters from, from all the other countries, from Russia and China and Japan. And and um, then that's kind of when I realized and mentally kind of flicked a switch for me. And I was like, okay, if I'm, if I'm one of the best junior skaters in the world, if I continue working hard and continue on this path, I could potentially be one of the best skaters in the world. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of when it really flicked a switch for me and everybody started kind of taking notice of what I could do. And the amount of training, once you knew you were at that point, must have been crazy, right? The amount of training right after you, the World Championships and you see that you have the potential to be in the Olympics. You have a chance to be a, a great Olympian. Right. So that, did, yeah. did your training even get stepped up even further after that? Yeah, that's the point where I ended up taking over. Um, you know, when you're younger and you're an athlete, I, I'm not sure if you, know, you said you talked to a number of different Olympians. There's usually somebody when they're younger, that's the driving force in their life, you know, that continues to, because no 12 year old wants to get up before school and go to the ice rink, no, you know, in no. 30 degrees and practice, but somebody's there to, to do it because they know that that's, you know, if that's where they, if they want to be an Olympian, that's what they have to do. 
Um, and so there's somebody there helping them along. And then, then like I said, like a, a, a switch turns on, and you end up taking over the steering wheel and driving and being like, okay, this is what I want to do. I know I want to be an Olympian now, and I know what it, it, it takes to get there. And that means, you know, getting up and working and doing the things I don't want to do um, in order to get the things that I do want. And that's, that's kind of what I talk about. Um, I talked about the discipline that, uh, that kind of took over for me as a 16 year old. I said, okay, I don't want to get up at six o'clock in the morning. I don't want to work out six hours a day, six days a week, but I do want to be a national champion and a world champion and an Olympic champion. I want to be those things. So I got to do the things I don't want to do in order to get the things I do want. And so, and that's, you know, that's kind of the, the route that I took where I just started taking over my, um, my training. And I had a great support group around me too, with my, like my parents, my sisters, I had great coaches around me to, to help support. But, um, at some point as an athlete, you got to take over and, um, you know, and then decide this is what I want to do. And about 16 is when, when I took over. So you you took over at 16, and before you know it, you're just competing and competing and, uh, and doing very well. And tell us about how you got into the Olympics for your first Olymp- Olympian, Olympics. What what happened, the, the process and all this stuff? What, did they think you would, would end up in there, or was it a – what was happening? It was just, well, it's one of those – with me particularly, it was a, a steady climb. Um, I was – Achieved some success at the, at the junior ranks, at the junior world championships. I was the, the world junior champion uh, at age 17. Then I turned to the senior ranks, which are the people that go to the Olympics. And so for a few years, I really kind of had to establish myself and find out what type of skater it was that I was going to be. Um, and then in, in 1998 uh, was the national championships. And I had placed second at the national championships the year before. So the top two go to the Olympics. And this was, so I was kind of positioned well to go to the Olympics. Um, I was ranked number two in the country, the top two go. Um, and I was the national championships on our Olympic trials. So I competed um, in Philadelphia, actually. Um, Philadelphia at, uh, well, the name of that, that arena has changed a lot. Sometimes it's Comcast Center, <laughs> First Union Center. It's a different name all the time. But that the, the arena where the, the Flyers play um, was the Olympic trials. And so, I went out and um, skated one of the best programs of my entire life and uh, ended up making that uh, first Olympic team and going to uh, Nagano, Japan, to represent the United States. And um, luckily enough, four years later, uh, the United States, uh, the Olympics were in the United States in Salt Lake City uh, in 2002, and I was um, fortunate enough to, to continue throughout that four years and make that Olympic team and have competed at an Olympics, not only in the United States and Salt Lake City, in my hometown country, but also in, in 1998 uh, in Japan was where the Olympics that my dad uh, competed in. So oh. I went to Japan where my dad competed in the Olympics and then was able to have a hometown Olympics in um, in uh, the USA, too. So I was uh, very fortunate to not only make the teams, but make them in uh, pretty cool places. All right, when we get back, we're going to go right into specifically, I guess, how, life after the Olympics, how you are, you know, you can't take away you're an Olympian, Michael. You can't, that, not many people could say that name. Uh, so that's, that's a key thing that leads you to opportunity, what you truly love about the sport, and how you can help others. Because once you have that name status, once you have that celebrity status, you can help others lead them to the next level. So when we get back more with Michael Weiss, two-time Olympian figure skater. You're listening to Toll Education Celebrity Show on the Toll Education Network, powered by the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment. And we'll be back in just a moment. We're back to the Total Education Celebrity Show on the Total Education Network, TotalTutor.net for more information. Twitter, Total Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment. Again, simplyg.com, beachlifestyle.com. And I'm with Michael Weiss, two time Olympian figure skater, and an interesting story so far. You are an Olympian, two time. What do you do after yep. when you're ready to move on? You've, you've, you've accomplished many different things in your career. What do you do next? And that life after figure skating, that, that's got to be tough for any Olympic athlete. Athlete. Yeah, the, the transition for me was um, I, I was fortunate enough when figure skating was um, very popular because of the whole Tanya Harding and Nancy mm-hmm. Kerrigan incident. Yeah. Um, that, that occurred, and all of a sudden figure skating was thrown into the spotlight. Um, there were a lot of opportunities as far as um, touring and performing go. 
I toured, toured with Champions on Ice for eight years, and we toured all around the U.S. Uh, and then I toured with uh, Smucker Stars on Ice for another eight years after that. So I was able to um, tour and make money while I was competing, and then also when I was done competing, I went with uh, Stars on Ice, and I was able to tour and provide for my family and, um, and uh, open up some other doors and opportunities as well through um, commentating. I'm doing commentating for NBC Sports. Uh, for the the next generation of competitors, um, and so it's uh, it's been a, a great ride competitively, but also you know after competition, uh, it's been uh, it's been been quite a journey as well. I've had a lot of lot of opportunities to travel the world, travel the country, um, and then also in, in um, I uh, opened a, I started the Michael Weiss Foundation um, not too long ago. Uh, we're coming up on our ninth year. Uh, and having it, and we award scholarships to the, the next generation of up-and-coming skaters because you know, my family struggled financially to keep me uh, in figure skating, and so I always said if I ever reached a point where, um, you know, where I could make enough money and uh, make enough connections and resources so that I could give back to another up-and-coming skater that I would, and that's kind of how my foundation started, and, and um, we've helped uh, a ton of young athletes achieve their dreams as Olympians as well. Well, Michael, I think it's fantastic to know, again, the, your sport, uh, figure skating, is one that they, uh, you guys can become professionals after your career in, as Olympic athletes. A lot of Olympic right. athletes uh, aren't able to do that in track and field and have those opportunities, and you guys have those opportunities to make money. And I guess you're right, yeah. figure skating became very popular after Nancy Kerrigan and all that, but uh, it's, it's yeah. still, still, it seems still very, very popular. When we're talking the Winter Olympics. We're going to watch figure skating is going to be the biggest thing coming out, so you really yeah. took you took the bull by the horns. I mean, you you uh, said I'm going to take this uh, and go on further and move on and be be successful. But when the foundation, that's tremendous that you want to give back. You're looking at helping others. You so you saw your parents struggle. They weren't to spend that kind of money. Yeah. Explain to people how expensive it is to compete as an Olympic athlete, especially when you don't have sponsorship or anything. You just have to keep going. Yeah, well, specifically in figure skating, you know, my parents, even, you know, back when I was growing up, they were spending forty and fifty thousand dollars a year on my skating wow. expenses. And, and now those numbers are, are even higher. Um, you know, skaters are now expected to have, you know, an overall coach. Then they have a spin coach and a jump coach and a choreographer. And they have skating costume designers and they have off ice trainers and they have, you know, the list goes on and on as far as their expenses go. And, and I just saw a number of kids that have a ton of, of talent and the drive to become, you know, an Olympic champion, but they didn't have the resources. You know, they, their parents, um, you know, may not be making the amount of money that can support $50,000 a year in training expenses. So I didn't want those kids to be limited and not be able to tr- achieve and go after their goals without, you know, the financial help and support they needed. And that was the motivation for starting the foundation. And since then, we've awarded um, over $500,000 in skating scholarships uh, to up-and-coming um, athletes. And even we started, uh, Mariah Nagasu was in the last Olympics uh, in Vancouver, and she was one of the athletes that we helped at a young age at um, 12, 13 years old. And she went on to place fourth at the, the Olympics in Vancouver. So these skaters have worked their, you know, worked their tail off um, and, and gotten a lot of support uh, from their coaches, coaching staff, and like that. But we did, we give them a little bit of extra money to make sure that they have what they need so that they can prepare um, for the Olympic Games without having to worry about making ends meet. they got enough to worry about when you're trying to, to win an Olympic medal or make an Olympic team. So we do what we can to award um, financial scholarships for them. And, and through such, we've been able to uh, get scholar, uh, sponsorship as well. Smucker sponsors the foundation, um, Musselman has uh, started to sponsor the foundation as well, and Pandora. So if, if we can use those types of companies to um, give money and support my foundation, then automatically that money goes right into the pockets That's of the great. skaters so that they can be the next generation of champions for the United States. 
So, Michael, uh, it's amazing the, uh, to hear, especially with your career, how you you went and stepped up. You said, I want to keep this sport going. I want to see the people like myself get an opportunity. You could have just, just continue to just be a professional and, until you're retired and be done with it and, you know, and do some commentating. But you decided to come up and start this foundation. And how many people once you said you were going to do this? said are you real this is are you really going to do this i've not heard of people doing this right am i correct yeah 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 not a lot of figure skaters do it i mean i i was the the first one to start a foundation that helped actually support um you know the next generation and and the thing is that all the skaters that i have we have a fundraising event once a year it's usually held in in, uh, september um down in the washington dc area and um you know, every time we have this show, I invite all the best skaters in the world. You know, Brian Boitano, Christy Amaguchi, Katya Gordieva, like all the, the, the former champions along with current champions, uh, and they all donate their time. They all uh, skate in the show so we can so that every dime raised goes right to the next generation. And a lot of the skaters are willing to do so because they were in that situation before. Most of them did struggle growing up, and their family did struggle paying for their training expenses. So. They've been uh, so supportive. Without the skaters, I wouldn't have been able to, to pull it off. And, and, and the show that we have is a, is a fun, family-oriented show. Um, everybody donates their time, from the ice rink donating their time, to the chairs on the ice donated, to the lighting donated, to the, you know, to the food at the reception afterward donated, so that all the, the expenses are so minimal that, um, that every single dime that we raise in ticket sales and sponsorship goes right out to the skaters. And that's, that was really my intention, to get as much back to them as possible. And um, we've been doing it successfully for, for uh, nine years now. When you're bringing these type of players, these type of players, skaters, into this event, this has got to be a, a hot ticket. You're, talk, you're telling me these names that are involved in yeah. raising money. And uh, mm-hmm. how difficult was it to kind of gather them all together? Or was it an easy process to get all these? Uh, well, it, Go ahead. It started out um, as more as a, as like, hey, like, like as a friend favor. You know, <laughs> I'd ask people, like, look, I'm, put, I'm putting together this show uh, in a couple months, and I need you guys to come. <laughs> That's basically what it is. Like, look, I'm going to probably get uh, some some um, some flight miles donated from some uh, some people who are supporting the foundation. I'll donate some of my own miles to fly you guys out here. We're all going to stay at my house. I'm not going to. I don't want a hotel bill. So literally, that's how. That's what the sales pitch was. We have a. We're going to have a big party at our house, and we're going to do a show over the course of the weekend. And people are going to love it. They're going to buy tickets, and we're going to raise money. And that's what it is. We had. Uh, I had 18 people staying at my house. Um, back in uh, September when we just had the show. So that's what it was. Everybody come over. We'll hang out, have a good time. The next day we'll skate a great show and uh, raise some money for the next generation and then uh, fly you out and you'll be on your way. And that's that's usually a tough sell. Like, hey, guys, I want you all to come in and skate for free. <laughs> you know? but everybody, everybody's been willing to do it. They've all stepped up to the plate year after year. And, um, and, and it's become kind of a tradition, you know, the, you know, the, my generation of, you know, Todd Eldridge and Yuka Sato and Brian Wakana, those people have all been supportive right from the start. And, um, and that's, that's why the foundation has been a success. Well, Michael, you have to be very happy with your success as an Olympian athlete. Uh, that now involved with the foundation and also working for NBC. I mean, it just must be so amazing to now, again, coming up to the next Olympics, to be able to be involved in all this in, in so many ways, to cover it and to be part of Olympic figure skating history in so many ways to some of the things you're doing. You, so you must be so impressed and, and I guess, and humbled in certain aspects to think about where you came from to where you are today. Yeah, I think that's that's the, the thing that's been um, so enjoyable for me is, you know, skating, uh, as, as much as it's, you know, just the actual medals go and all that, that's nice, but the things that you learn and the opportunities I've been given through the sport have um, have just been you know, like a dream come true. It sounds like such a cliche, but, um, you know, at a young age, when I started at nine years old, I would have never thought that I would become a figure skater or a professional figure skater or, or be involved in the sport as long as I have. And and um, now to, to look back on everything and, and realize that, uh, you know, I did what I loved for so long and, and uh, I'm still enjoying it is uh, pretty cool. 
So, Michael, do you have any other projects coming up uh, in the near future? Always people that are they have their own brand like you have. There's got to be other things going yep. on with you, isn't there? Well, we have. Uh, I'm doing uh, a number of shows um, that are going to air on NBC. Um, Disney Skating is putting on uh, the Pandora Skating Series. So in November, there's going to be on NBC. I'm, I'm co-hosting some shows with Chris Yamaguchi and then also um, actually performing in them as well. And uh, one of them is November 2nd at uh, Penn State uh, University. We're having a, um, a show there. My daughter is a singer, and she sings. Uh, she sang, wrote her first original. And so she's going to be singing her first original uh, song, and I'm going to be performing to it. And Sarah Evans is going to be performing live, and Christy Amaguchi, and, and all, all great cast of skaters. So that's the, the first of, a, of an entire series of, of four different shows that will televise uh, in November and December and January on NBC. All right, so I also remember the Pittsburgh fans are not far from Penn State, so my Pittsburgh listeners yeah. should go check it out for yeah. sure. All right, that's uh, that's awesome, and I think uh, uh, especially you're doing a lot for sure, Michael. I appreciate you definitely uh, taking the time. Where do you see yourself in the next ten years in in this in this sport? Where do you, where do you want to see yourself place yourself in the next ten years? Where do you think with all the different things you're doing? I think I would like to continue to grow the foundation uh, and continue to support support figure skating. Um, certainly, be involved uh, on the commentary side with um, you know it's a lot. I always joked about it. It's uh, you know I always used to listen to Dick Button and Scott Hamilton always me used too. to commentate yeah. me on TV, and I was like, oh, I could you know like they made a mistake saying this or that, and then. And then you realize when you actually do it yourself, you're like, okay, it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> yes. now, now having done it myself, you know, all the things that are going through your mind when a skater is skating, you're trying to analyze everything, and you may be thinking about one thing and you say another. And so I have a lot of respect for what they've done over the years, and um, hopefully I can uh, be in those shoes and, and, um, and commentate for, uh, for an Olympics in the future. Well, we'll definitely have to have you back on to promote your next event, meaning in September for next year's uh, foundation and kind of promote it to all the people that will be attending and help you in that process. I, I appreciate you definitely uh, coming by the show. And uh, interesting, Michael, uh, so many different things going on. Definitely a jack of all trades. You really have uh, done everything you can to help the uh, figure stating community. And I know when I'm listening to the Olympics, I'll be like, when watching the Olympics, I'll say, Hey, I interviewed Michael. Pretty cool. You know, <laughs> it's funny when I interview all these Olympians, it seems like a blur, but then I'm saying, well, that's why I like to talk to you, not just about the foundations, to learn more about you and what you're doing and your passion. And that usually leads to why you did the foundation. And that's why I try to bring that this platform on this radio program to promote foundations that are true and truly helping others. So where can we, fi- our listeners, find information and uh, donate to the foundation and learn more about you, Michael? Uh, well, and my website, michaelweiss.org, is my website. And, um, yeah, we have information there on how you can make a donation to the foundation and information on um, our 10th annual um, Ice Champions Live, which is my uh, Michael Weiss Foundation fundraiser. That will be held um, uh, in September of next year. So all the information will be on there. It will be another great show, and we'll be, be raising some more money. All right, we'll have to reach out to you in the summer to have you back on to, to talk about the event and everything. So it was good talking to you, and uh, best of luck. Uh, it's uh, real, You're doing some fantastic things. Thanks for calling, Michael. Great. Thank you for having me. All right, take care. Okay, bye-bye. You're listening to the Education Celebrity Show on the Education Network, and we'll be back in just a moment.